All right, so I'm here with Sean Avery, and Sean had me on his podcast, No Gruffs Given, a few months ago, and he said, he DM'd me and he said, I want you to build me a baby gate. So pretty soon we're going to be cutting to me building Sean's baby gate, which I did two days ago, and it came out pretty great, but I did leave three enormous grease stains in his pristine driveway that we'll try to fix at the end of this. I brought all this stuff. This is an experimental thing. You guys are going to watch me build a baby gate and listen to Sean and I talk for an hour because I love podcasts. They're like Ritalin for me. And I listen to them when I'm building and making things. And it oddly helps me concentrate yeah. and makes me less forgetful and I get into a flow state better. So yeah. maybe some of our people listen to it. So Sean was an NHL hockey player, which to me is absolutely astonishing. I don't know anyone from my county where I grew up who went pro in any sport. I don't know anybody who knows anybody who went pro in a pro sport. It is such unbelievable rarefied air and I think that's one of the things that Sean brings to his podcast is this point of view. And it's this like killer point of view and also very strong and sturdy. So like, so you must have been the best hockey player, like always, right? When you were a kid, like you were the, like they were like, they had their eye on you. Everybody knew, right? Yeah. Is that how it went? Yeah. So first of all, I want to, I want to rewind a little bit because the baby gate I'm going to call it baby gate. Okay. Your first video, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. You showed your baby gate mm -hmm. when you were walking everyone, everyone around the, the house in Topanga. And it was just a quick, it was probably six to eight seconds. You, you showed a couple of cuts and you showed the baby gate. Right. So I hadn't seen you since probably New York. And I said, oh, shit, Van lives in California now, Topanga Canyon. So that's when I DM'd you and said, I need you to build me a baby gate. Um, so that's, that's how we ended up here. But was I always the best player? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's funny because you think about, like, I don't really know anyone else that became a professional other than the professionals that I played with. Right. So like I didn't know an NHL player until I played in the NHL, which kind of is interesting because think about from the time I was eight till I was 18, I played with a lot of different players. So, mm. yeah, I guess it is very rare when you think about it. Um, and when I think about was I always the best player, I think that I was always the player that had a lot of different attributes but the one that I think was the most important was that I was never affected by anyone else mm. like I never really gave a shit what anyone else said about me or if they said that I played too dirty or if I was too mean or <laughs> if I didn't pass the puck enough or if I didn't back check hard enough which I think in your early development years those types of things can affect a player and, and a kid can go, well, maybe I don't, maybe I'm not good enough. Right. I think the guys that separate themselves that do make it, they don't get affected by all of that other stuff because I don't think that it's something that, you know, God gives you that determines whether or not you play. I think it's whether or not you work harder than everyone else. Mm. Were you not co coachable when you were really young? Did you like? Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was. I wasn't coachable, but I had intuition. So sometimes when you had, I think, and that's what you're sort of born with, because I don't know. My dad played, so maybe I, maybe there's something genetically inside of me. I had intuition. My intuition sometimes challenged the intuition of the coaches that were coaching me. You know that maybe didn't play hockey. Mm. Um, and I also had a little bit of intuition on like where I was going to go. 
Like I thought I was, I always thought that I was going to be a better player than all the guys that I was playing with. How, how young were you when NHL like hit your mind? Like, I, Oh my God, I could go, I could go all the way. I mean, I, I think without knowing how much work it was going to be, I think I decided that that's what I was going to do when I was 10. Like, I didn't think about being a fireman. I didn't think about anything else. It was complete singularity. Like, this is what I'm going to do. Mm. Wow. That is, that is, that's like genius. That's yeah. finding your thing early. I heard, you know, Bob Ross, the painter. Yeah. I watched that documentary yeah, I about him. watched it yet. And he said, I, I don't want to butcher this quotation, but he said that talent is an interest pursued. Uh-huh. And I think the guys that get their 10,000 and gals that get their 10,000 hours in early, Billie Jean King said the same thing. I think she said she was either eight or 10 and she knew she wanted to be number one in the world. Yeah. Think about it. I mean, that's why I say that I don't think you were born with a special skill set. I think you were given something that you really, really were attached to and you decided that you were going to do that earlier. Mm. Versus a guy that decides to do it when, you know, he's 18. Mm. It's very rare that an athlete decides that they're going to be a professional athlete later in life. It's happened in Mm. a couple occasions. You've heard of like uh, a South African rugby player that came over to play rugby in America and decided to play football. Mm. American football. There's that Philadelphia Eagles guy who was a bartender. Yeah. 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 How much of a role did your dad play? I think um, he played an interesting role in the fact that he never pushed me in either direction. No kidding. No, which I think is the biggest faux pas of parents now is that they burn their kids out. Yeah. You know, my dad never said a word. And, you know, he played, you know, it's like... uh, he never said a word. It was always, um, I think he probably kind of laughed maybe to think like I, I would be a dad now thinking like a, a 12 year old, like pissed off at himself at how he played, mm. you know? Yeah. So maybe there's something to that, you know? Um, and, and I think there is because there was always kids that were better players than us when, when, when I was younger, I say us because I know some of my peers would probably say the same thing, where they had crazy parents. Okay. And they just burned the kids out. Yeah. You know? Um, But I also think my parents didn't, they never said, you know what, you you can't focus entirely on this. You have to, like, play some, you have to play soccer in the summer. Mm. I think there's something, something there with, like, how I was raised just helped fuel the fire without mm. really doing it. And where are you from? Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Toronto's, I lived in Toronto for um, six months, like in 2005, maybe 2006. And one of the things that I found so, so beautiful about Toronto, first of all, Canadians, lo- generally speaking, love winter yeah. and they're really good at it. Yeah. And like, I could tolerate winter. I can't do New York winter anymore because it's like 33 degrees and raining. Yeah. But in Toronto, it snowed every day in the winter. One of the magical things about Toronto is like every neighborhood. I don't know if all of Canada is like this. Every neighborhood had not only an ice hockey rink that was like publicly maintained, but also like a free skating rink next to it and a Zamboni to maintain both of them. And I believe they're free. I yeah. think you just show up and go like almost 24 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the, it's our, it's our national sport. And I think that, uh, accessibility is definitely one thing, you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of rinks. The weather is perfect for it because it's freezing cold for eight months of the year, mm-hmm. no matter where you are in Canada. Um, but yeah, I think, and, and and everyone plays at some point, you know, even the kids that don't really like it know how to skate, you know, because we go on skating trips for school. Yeah. Like you go to the 
the rink and or the outdoor rink and we skate as part of like a field trip. So it's just kind of ingrained in the in the DNA of I re- everyone. I remember hearing Canadians say, Oh, I was skating before I could walk and yeah. thinking, well, obviously that's an exaggeration. But then when I lived there, I saw what they meant and parents hold their kids between their legs as they're skating kids yeah. that can't walk yeah. with skates on their feet and like low as if they're lowering them down into water lower them onto the ice and the kids you can see the kids getting a feel for their skates going yeah. going back and forth yeah that's that's true or you that you would uh you'd have a chair oh yeah 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 and they just give you a chair so you could hold onto the chair and you can push the chair and yeah So the pursuit must like start to accelerate. And then when you're about what, like 17, how old, like hockey guys are really young, aren't they? No, I mean, I, I think, uh, so I left home at 15 to play in Canada has this, um, sort of a really a beautiful feeder system. They have this, this major junior hockey league, which is set up. Uh, there's a Western league, there's a, a, a Quebec league, and there's an Ontario league. Mm. So really, all of Canada is covered by this these three leagues. And when you're 15, they have a draft. So it's, 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 it mirrors the NHL to a certain extent. So you get drafted. So I got drafted when I was 15. When are you playing for a school or are you playing for a club? It's a, it's like a, before you get drafted, like who are they, uh, dra- where are you drafting you from? Yeah. So, so from a, a, a team, not a school, it's all private, private. Uh, it, I played in this league called the Metro Toronto hockey league, the MTHL, which is, uh, the, all the Toronto teams. So there's probably 15 different Toronto teams mm. and they're private organizations uh, not for profits. They, they run them like businesses. So you, you go and pick what team you want to play for. And, um, you know, the best teams usually are always the best teams cause they have the best organization and they mm-hmm. give their players equipment because they've been winning for so long. And do they cost more Do the best teams cost more to play? Uh, for, no, no, the, the best teams cost the same. You just get f- more stuff given to you. Mm. Um, so it's a little bit rigged in that, but, uh, you know, it's a private business. They just run their business better than some of the other organizations. Uh, so I got drafted from a team, uh, from the, I played midget, which is, um, basically that's, that's the age you play in minor hockey to move you on to junior hockey. Okay. So then you pack up your bags and you go, and I went and played in Owen Sound, Ontario, which was about a three hour drive from my home that I lived with my parents. And, um, I think the the, the town, it was a town, it wasn't a city had, uh, I think there was 12,000 people in the town and the arena held 3000. And, you know, it was like very similar to high school football in the States or Texas, but, um, in Canada, they call it major junior hockey. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, so you, you pack up and you move away and like, that was it. When I left, when I was 15, I haven't lived at home since. Wow. Yeah. So who are your, who are your guardians? Like who are the people that tell you you can't go out drinking? You live with a, a local family. They call them billet families. Okay. So Sometimes these families had kids that played mm-hmm. previously. Mm-hmm. Um, I lived with some legendary billet families. I lived with uh, uh, my my billet in Kingston, Ontario, a guy by the name of Larry Bullet, who I still talk to today, like regularly. Uh, he was a prison guard at Kingston Penitentiary, which is, I think, Canada's. Uh, Malts like Max Prison. Mm-hmm. A lot of all the bad Canadian killers go there. But my billet, Larry Bullet, was he was just like a hockey fan, and he yeah. he just decided I was the first player that he had ever billeted. He was he just decided like uh, this could be fun, and it's really amazing because you live with this family who aren't your parents. It's like 
living with a family where you have two step parents. Yeah. You know, n- normally yeah. you have one parent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the step parent was probably like, well, I can't really discipline you. Right. But now you have two of them. Yeah. So it's kind of just a, like an honor trust system. Like there's probably a little bit more respect than if they were your real parents, right? Uh, In a def- weird way. Definitely. If you were brought up like, yeah. with yeah, yeah. any sort of, um, family atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. But we ran fucking wild. I mean, totally wild. Like, being a dad now and thinking about the stuff that we did. Mm. You uh, weren't out of control in LA. See, this scares me about LA. Well, yeah, the, we were in a town with, yeah, we were in a town with, with 12,000 people. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't really, anytime we did anything, everyone knew about it, mm. you know, like, uh, and you guys were probably a little bit like kind of famous for the town, right? Definitely. I mean, we didn't, you know, we never really had, um, we never really had towny friends. It was very rare to have towny friends because mm. the towny guys didn't like us because we, no, of course not. We yeah. were, you know, taking their towny girls and we were like the the famous guys, right? Yeah. Um, and we weren't from there, mm. so very interesting. Owen Sound was in the snow belt of of Ontario, so like sometimes you would go to bed. And you would wake up and you could go online, uh, YouTube and check these videos. You'd, you'd go to bed and you'd wake up and the whole entire house would be covered in snow. So you'd have to, they, we keep shovels inside. Wow. Cause when you open the door in the morning, you'd have to shovel your way out the front door. Yeah. So how deep, so the snow, is it like up to your eyebrows or your neck or? It would be over, it would be. On a let's say you had a one story house, it mm-hmm. would be over the front door of a one story house. Yeah, you go you go to bed and you get six or so seven. So where feet. do you put the snow from inside? Where do you put the first like two feet of snow? <laughs> you just pat it down. Okay. Cause it's so fluffy. Right. Yeah. It's like the snow that I'm talking about is like beautiful snow. Mm. It's not rainy the really snow. really cold weather snow. It's just perfect. And you yeah. could just compact it down mm-hmm. to get yourself out. You know, we were also broke. We we would get 150 bucks every two weeks and a $20 um, gas voucher. We would actually get a voucher because they knew if they gave us the cash, we would blow the cash. Mm. So we had $20 every two weeks in gas and we got 300 bucks a month. Okay. And that was, you know, what we lived on. And is that for you and Larry Bullet or is No, he got a, he got, he got his, he got his own check. All right. Uh, you couldn't drive so you're, cause you're only 15, right? Uh, I couldn't drive. I drove my second year. Okay. So my second year I went back with a car. You barter your $20. If, If you can't drive, you still get your $20 gas money. So then you, you barter that and. Yeah, it's a crazy system. I was looking at at um, players that made the NHL from the Metro Toronto Hockey League, the league that we got drafted out of. Mm-hmm. And for our birthday year, I think there was four players that made the NHL. Now, this is the best league. In and the, how many total kids in the league? There was probably nine hundred just so in our four out of just 900. just in our birth year. And those are the elite kids. Those are the, the 900 best, elite kids. That's, that's the best league in Canada. In the elite country for hockey. Yeah. Oh, my God. And four of us made the NHL. It was nuts, you know? Like, we would take... We, we took a bus everywhere. The first time I tried everything was sort of on this bus. Like, the first time I tried chewing tobacco was on this, this bus. We were on a bus from... Uh, Owen Sound to Sault Ste. Marie, which is an eight and a half hour bus ride. Um, and I s- was like passed out in, in my own puke on the floor of the bus for the, f- for most of it. Were you drinking and dip? No, just, 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 yeah, it, it was a very interesting atmosphere to grow up in. You know, we would go to school, our, our schedules were set so that we wouldn't have to go, go to school past one o'clock. And then you'd go right to the rink mm. and you would work out and then we would practice and we'd be done by probably f- six. And then, you know. So one to six of five hours a day. Yeah. And then on Saturdays, and s- did you ever get a day off? Uh, no. 
So uh, the odd Monday or Sunday, depending on the schedule, because mm. you'd always play two games on the weekend. Mm. So uh, Friday night or Saturday or Saturday, Sunday, depending. It takes like 10 years to learn how to skate, right? No, not necessarily. Depends how old you are. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you start at eight, uh, no, you, you could learn how to skate in a year or two. Okay. Because I've been trying my whole life and I'm terrible. But you probably only do it a couple times a year. Right. That's true. You know, like the Rideau Canal in Ottawa. I've done that. Is a, that that's I've what people it. do to take to work. Yeah. They skate to work. Yeah. That's uh, that's one of the one of the great things. And it's a world class, wonderful thing that doesn't even happen every year. Yeah. And uh, what it is, is they freeze. Is it called the Ottawa Canal? Yeah. It's. 11 miles or yeah. something like this Yeah, of ice rink. And it's, I mean, I would be so proud to be a Canadian yeah. just because of that. Yeah. It's and a, I it's, drove up one day and did it and it's miles and my, imagine Hans Brinker, you're skating for miles and there's little like, what do they call them? Beaver tails beaver or something? Tails. There's like little a mall. shops yeah. Yeah. set up with hot chocolate and little warming stations. Yeah. It gets rightly cold. It gets oh, like yeah. 30 below. Yeah. Easily 30 below. 30 below would be, a, it would be the norm. Yeah, people skate to work. Like mm. they don't, because there's no transit. I mean, in the winter and they just put their skates on. People skate to work. The kids skate to school. Yeah. I mean, it's fucking wild. Wow. I think out of all the major sports, it's it's the most difficult. Like I, I would say that hockey players are the most athletic athletes mm. out of out of baseball, football soccer, um, basketball, Mm. like any of those athletes, if you put them in a room with, with a hockey player, a hockey player is getting out of that room. Or if we did a mini (laughs) Olympics, yeah, because we are the only ones that aren't on our feet. We do everything in our sport on a, um, it's like an eighth and eight. Yeah. Less yeah. than less than a half an inch. Yeah, blade. Yeah, with a stick in our hands, mm-hmm. and then a puck. So it's like there's two things that aren't even attached to us. There's three things: the skates, the stick, and then a puck. Mm-hmm. If you do, if you're a basketball player or a football player, you're using your feet and your hands. Yeah. We're, we're, our sport is the hardest by a landslide. Yeah. Um, maybe surfing's harder because you don't have tides and weather and all that stuff. I mean, of everything I've tried, nothing comes close to surfing. Yeah. I guess the test would be you get a representative from each sport and then you have them all try a sport that none of them have yeah. ever played before. We would, we would, we would blow them, blow yeah. them away. Yeah. Cause you have to be good with your fingers. Every, everything. And your feet. Yeah. We're yeah. not hu- We're not native to the ground. Crazy. Is it true? You, is, there's like a legend that you threw your skates into the Hudson river when you <laughs> retired. That's not true. Is it? I mean, I said, I, I said that I did, but I haven't skated once since I stopped playing. I understand that. And I also can't imagine it. Like yeah. I understand it. Yeah. Not a lot of people do it like that, but, um, but I also feel like I could play today. Like I yeah. could put skates on and like, I can still feel in my head, the feeling of what it feels like to take a pass or take a shot or just be on my edges and move like it's just hardwired into my head yeah i was watching boxing last night they had uh this youtuber jake paul yeah did he have another fight last night yeah he fought tyrone tyron woodley who woodley's a ufc guy and who won uh paul won but they went wow but they went eight rounds and i i think woodley he knocked Paul down like he like it was a good fight. Mm-hmm. But to watch Woodley, um, I would work both of those guys. You really think you could work a UFC guy? Yeah. Do you have a ground game? Do you have, did you ever wrestle? No, but so 
I'm saying from a boxing standpoint, take oh, that. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. They, I see. I see. The, I see. You yeah. take that out of it because they don't have, um, there's no fluidity to them. Mm. You know, Connor's a different, a different beast because, and even when Connor box, like, uh, their athleticism is, is it's, it's caged. Mm. Think about it. Like it's, it's in a, in an octagon, mm. the way they walk is very specific. They walk with their toes pointed out. They, yeah. they're not, um, they're not, they're not, I, I, I don't think that they're as developed athletically as, um, a lot of athletes hmm. because they don't move anywhere. There's no, think of a, a football player or a gazelle, you know, you get to open it up Yeah, and you have to jump in the air and catch like a wide receiver hmm. or, um, I don't know. I just find it interesting to, to see the different dynamics of some of the sports, you know? And you've been in so many fights that you can kind of have a, I, you, you're not speaking from the, from the armchair. I you, mean, I fought on the street a lot. I fought uh, in hockey quite a bit. Um, yeah, you have to, there's a movement like, um, and you see Mayweather's a great example of like, when you fight, you're, you're, you fight to not get hit, mm. but you also fight to win, mm. which means you have to like, it's all about timing and movement. It's not, it's not. And to do that, you have to be able to like move your body and kind of, um, you, you can work in a phone booth, but you don't necessarily have to like, and watching that fight last night, like it, it lacked that type of athleticism. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm really, in favor of these guys like the Paul brothers going and bringing more money and attention to the sport. I think whoever says that those guys are idiots are idiots. Yeah. They're, they're because just... you can't be an idiot and be on the world stage, whether it's podcasting athleticism, you just, it, 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 there's too many potholes to step in. Yeah. So the, so the two of them have the highest selling pay-per-views of the year. Uh, Logan Paul fought Mayweather yeah, I think again, same same sort of thing with those guys. They don't care what other people think. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's sort of like a make or break it in in the world that we're living in today. Yeah. Um, if you care what other people think, you're in big trouble. Yeah. Because you're just always going to be affected mm. by comments and likes, and mm. yeah, it's a different. We're in a totally different fucking world now. Yeah. Uh, and neither of them care. And they're doing, they've done, they're also entertainers, but they're actually, you know, backing it up with athleticism. Mm. I mean, Jake Paul is going to be the, the highest earning athlete in the world mm. soon. Yeah. Because it, of his podcast not, and because of the... If not, if not this year, he's, he maybe has already done it. Hmm. I mean, I don't know what he'll end up making from these last, from these two pay-per-view fights that he's done, but, um, he's definitely in the top 20 highest paid athletes right hmm. now. Yeah. And, you know, was he a YouTuber or was he always an athlete that was YouTubing? You doesn't know? matter. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. Jake fought a, a YouTuber, then an NBA guy, then a UFC guy that couldn't, didn't know how to fight. He was a wrestler. Okay. And then just fought another UFC guy who was oh, a wait. striker. Um, the guy who got knocked out in seven seconds. What was his name? Ben Askren. Ben Askren. Okay. Yeah. After that fight, I heard your podcast. Yeah. And you were just like, you were talking about Paul. Yeah. And you were like, I would make him reconsider. It's yeah. life. And I thought, man, I would, oh, somebody please make that happen. What a cool thing. I mean, I don't want you to get hurt though. No, I would fuck, I would fuck, I would fuck him up bad. I, I would rather, uh. But he's a trained boxer, Sean. Like, um, don't you think that that's like, just, I, I just mean technique. I'm just talking about technique and hours in the ring 
Yeah, I mean, he's been doing it for three years. If I had, if I had a three month camp, mm-hmm. um, I fought on skates. Yeah, dude. I know that's your that's which, your advantage. Which the only difference between what we did, so I did it. We did it on skates. Mm-hmm. Technically, we fought in phone booths because we fought attached to each other. Because yeah. the only way you can fight in hockey is to be attached to the other guy. Because that's how you get your leverage to punch. Mm -hmm. So if you can use your feet instead of using the other opponent, like that's amazing. Yeah. So much easier. Oh, yeah. Um, So think about it. Like for us to fight in hockey, we, we start separated and then we come together to fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the only way we can throw a punch is by using the leverage of holding on to the person that we're fighting to throw a punch because with, with skates, you can't, um, it's not like a figure skate. We don't have any point right. There's where no we stopper can, on it. Yeah. We can't yeah. dig into the ice. Yeah. You know, um, it's totally different. So if you put me in a boxing ring it's game over. Like I, I can, you know, like, have you seen a, a hockey fight? So there, oh my God, it's unbelievable. I watched your feet that last replay. I watched your feet. Okay. No one gets the NHL moment and very few of us get the moment where it's just like, for me, it was like when we got the HBO show Yeah. and my like Casey and I got the HBO show and it just, there must have been like near misses, like I'm gonna get in, I'm not gonna get in, da 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 da. Or was it like a lock? No, I mean I I didn't get drafted, which I think um, growing up that's the main goal is to get drafted. You mm-hmm. you kind of have to get drafted yeah. now, not so much, um, but then you did. So I didn't get drafted. When I didn't get drafted, I it I, I remember I was at a pool party and. Um, I came home and I was like, did I get drafted? And no, I didn't get drafted. And is, was it Larry? Was it who? Larry Bullet. Like who had the news? Oh, I was, I was home for the summer. So I was with my parents. Okay. I wasn't deterred whatsoever. Like I remember not an ounce. It was like, okay, whatever. How old were you? Uh, 17. Okay. So then I went, uh, because I didn't get drafted, I could get like uh, invited as sort of like a walk on. Mm-hmm. to go to a training camp, but I could get to choose any camp that I wanted to go to really, because, um, I was still in a position that I could go as a walk on. Mm-hmm. So I ended up going to Detroit Red Wings camp and long story short is I went to training camp as a 17 year old. Most of the, my peers were drafted. So they were just going to camp to, get their first NHL camp, like a little experience. I went to camp and I left camp with a contract before any of the the guys that got drafted got contracts because if Detroit wanted to keep me, Mm -hmm. they would have had, they had to sign me to a contract because they didn't own me because they didn't draft me. They had to pay me to go back to my junior team and play for, I think I played two years Okay. until, um, I actually went and played pro. So then I went to Detroit, didn't make the team, mm. played a full year in their minor league team, which was in Cincinnati, Ohio Okay. in the American hockey league, which is the, the triple a baseball. Sure. Um, played there for a year following year. Went back to training camp again. So now this is my, probably my fourth training camp, Mm -hmm. NHL training camp. Mm -hmm. And that year, that training camp, I made the team. First NHL. 21. 21. Yeah. And so when is the moment, like the, when you were reduced to tears? Um, When you were like, oh my God, I fucking. I mean, I, I just remember my first NHL game, which is that, that's, you know, when you're growing up, you just think to yourself, I just want to play one NHL game. Yeah. If I play one NHL game, then I made the NHL. Yeah. Then I, that's what I wanted to do since I was 
10 years old, yeah. eight years old. Yeah. And I did it and I made it. Did you ever win a Stanley cup? I won a Stanley cup my first year. No. With Detroit 2002. I think that the team Detroit in 2002 was maybe the greatest NHL team ever assembled just from a pure uh, statistic standpoint, like 11, 12 Hall of Famers. I think it was the best team on paper that ever played in the NHL. Wow. Was that the team you were talking about? Um, you were on set with Christian Bale and that he had this energy about him that when you were in the room with him, and you said that there was somebody, I want to say it was Yarmer Yager, but it wasn't Yarmer Yager. Steve Eiserman. Eiserman, that's yeah. it, that's it. So Steve Eiserman was the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest captain in NHL history, which, you know, means he's a very special person. Like mm. he has an energy and an aura to him that, he leads men into battle, yeah. right? Like yeah. I love that you called the war. I, I've been to the war. Yeah, he's been to the war. Yeah, he's been in the war. He's yeah. been in the trenches. He's led. The, he's led the battle into, you know, the line of other men. Yeah, these guys have a an aura to them. You know, they yeah. understand what it feels like to carry huge amounts of stress on. They might on, be enlightened uh, on their. Sh the, that might be what enlightenment. I see these surfers and these motocross guys, and I say, "You can't." You're he's enlightened yeah. in these moments that you're watching them. He is not conscious. He is not. He is enlightened. Yeah. He is just a body in the. He's just en pure energy. Yeah. They have that feeling to them. Yeah. Right. Um. So, but to see it in two different mediums, like to see Eiserman in in the sport world, the hockey world, and then. Christian Bale on a movie set. Mm. There's really not that much difference between the two. Mm. Like uh, they they have the same. The aura is the same. Yeah. They they nothing can phase these these men. Their success isn't hollow. Yeah. They've seen every nook and cranny of every situation mm. you know they can identify with with everything because they've been there and seen it mm. um but i guess they also understand what it needs to be done to make the the final product as good as it can be mm. i did a movie with him i worked one day um this is a david o russell movie this was a couple of months ago i got the part on a Monday, okay, we were shooting on a Wednesday. Tuesday, I spent the whole day. I had to get a COVID test. So I had to go for a fitting. I got the sides to the scene on Tuesday night at like 9.15. I think we had a 6.30 call time. It was a, an hour away. I, I couldn't get the, the lines. Like, it was... Two and a half pages. Oh. I had no idea what the movie was about. Mm. Okay. I got to set. I walked on set and the scene was with Bale, John David Washington and Chris Rock. I start the scene with Bale and I'm with him the whole scene. And we have a long walk, like a, f probably a 25 to 30 yard walk where we have dialogue back and forth. I didn't know my lines. I didn't know what the movie was about. He knew this. He had no idea who I was. He didn't know that I had had this life previously. I was a fucking hired day, got day player actor. I think he felt something off of me that didn't, that made him understand that and I'm not putting myself in Christian Bale's category, but like that I've been in a war yeah. somewhere. Yeah. He felt that. Yeah. And what he did, he just, every single time in between takes, he just ran the lines with me. He ran the lines with me. Yeah. And one of the producers, I think like an hour in or something kind of pulled me aside and he was like, you know, we're all like, everyone's just like in, in awe of what's going on right now. Just watching 
Christian Bale just run the lines with me. Yeah. In between every single take. Yeah. And like, wow. you know, most would probably, I don't know what they would do, mm. but they wouldn't do that. No. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was like, a, it was like, a, it's not even a real moment in my head, like to think about it, you know, because first of all, if I fuck that up, I, I don't know what happens to me. Right. You, you know, and it's not, <laughs> and there's no, it's different between, you know, in sports, you can, you can go out and work your ass off and, and perform. And if you make a mistake, everyone's like, you know what, that shit happens. But in this medium, we don't have time for that. Like, we're not here for you to work hard, but you can't fucking do it. Mm. Like you have one job, you have to say the lines. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the fucking lines, you can't say the lines. Yeah. But I got them, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't, but we got it. And the only reason we got it was because of Bale. If Bale had have, you know, done what I think most have done yeah. and put the heat on me, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have got through it. Mm. But he, he, he helped me through that. Wow. What's the movie called? Canterbury Glass. And it's not out yet. No. No. I think it's, you know, it's coming out soon. Well, um, man, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, those are the, those are the, um, I think special moments too, that you, you have to be in, in moments of conflict to be able to like learn from shit. I mean, that's why all drama is it's conflict, conflict, conflict. That's what drama is. And story is, right. and story is what we built our entire civilization on. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's more real than real life right. story. Um, I want to get to like your conversion from athlete to artist. Um, but what, can you give me like a, like the NHL life? Like what? Yeah. So professional sports is an, it's an emotional roller coaster, but you can control that by how hard you work. Okay. And how well you prepare. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great life. It's a very demanding life, but I, I, I don't know why you would want to do something else, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's the most fun part of it. And so did you get in, did you injure out or what? No, I played, tw I played 12 years in the NHL mm -hmm. at 32. I just decided I didn't want to play anymore. Okay. That's rare, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could have kept going, you know? I don't know what, what it was. I don't know what gave me the strength to make that decision, but I made it and I got a lucky bounce and a friend of mine put me, put me in a movie one day. Um, Peter Berg, who's like a pretty yeah. well-known American director. And I was like, Oh, this is, was it Patriot day? Patriots. Yeah. Day, yeah. Patriots. Day. I have one line in the movie, but I was, I like, remember you're at the boat. On set, yeah, yeah. yeah said, Look, it's on Avery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I just was like, oh, the, you know, I think when I played, there's something very um, artistic about playing a game. I was a character, you know. There was a storyline built into it. This is a new challenge, and when I pull this off, I'll be able to say to people like you don't know how hard the, the, this was, right? Because yeah. you have to basically learn a, a full new medium. I mean, yeah. I, for, for the last seven years, I've been learning a new medium. Yeah, your 10,000 hour clock is starting at fucking zero at yeah. age whatever, 30 or whatever. Yeah, 34, 34. Yeah. So, and now I'm just able to finally like work. Mm. But I'm going to do it till hopefully I'm, 80. Yeah. So I have no problems with that. Yeah. Um, and it's fun. It's fun because it has all the same ingredients, you know, the pressure's high, mm -hmm. there's money on the line. You've got one last take to get it. Everything relies on you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. big bucks. It's performance. If you fuck up, yeah. you know, people are going to talk. Yeah. Um, and 
the better your performance is, the more opportunity you get. Yeah. I mean, it's the same as sports. Yeah. So there's a ton of similarities. Um, but it's also quite fun mm. and challenging. And I think that's the, the addiction mm. that I have to it. I want to ask you what you think I should do, like career wise. Yeah. And then I'll tell you what I think you should do. Yeah. So Van, if you were, if you were to ask me what you should do career wise moving forward, Mm. I I would say to you that, I mean, the writing is on the wall for today, for tomorrow, for the next, for the foreseeable future. You have to keep making these videos, these YouTube videos. It's pain that you're getting paid to do it. Right the accumulation of it is going to grow because we need the consistency of seeing these videos and then we send them to more people. Um, It's going to put you in a position every time you get a view that gives you your currency to make more of these Mm. either outside of YouTube or inside of YouTube where brands are going to then pay you to do this. So I see the writing on the wall for this, like for the next three, four, five years, I don't think you should do anything else. All right. So just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. That's what I was hoping you'd say. So now my turn. Yeah. Okay. So I heard the other day, I heard you, um, you had your buddy on from Canada who was a standup. Oh yeah. Yeah. Aaron Berg. Aaron Berg. Yeah. And you talked about going and doing standup comedy. Yeah. And I was just like, don't do it. Not don't do it, but don't pursue it as anything beyond an experience because I just think that is, not that you're not funny. One of the things about your podcast that's amazing is how serious and earnest you are and hilarious in just your honesty. It it is funny. I laugh on my run. But I think that we underestimate what that art is. And I think it's a 20 year. Why so few people? I think it's one of those... 20 year investments. Whereas my thing was a 10 year investment after 10 years, I was earning a living, but that's a 20 year thing. So just like you've now sort of invented a new medium, like this video is going to be something new that I don't think a lot of people have seen. Like you're, you're doing two things. You're, Mm. you're, you're, you've recorded a podcast that you're going to lay over, uh, a baby gate video. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Let's hope it works. My whole th- desire from a comedic standpoint, yeah. I, I'm i not looking to do what they do, which is they try and calculate a room and work off of emotion. Okay. I want to do what I have been doing for the last 20 years, which is talk shit. I want to walk into a room yeah. and obliterate everyone in the room to the sense that crowd work is going to give me my material. Yeah. So if I say to you, if I walk in and I go, uh, so you're the, the workwear guy. Yeah. 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 Like how did you become a workwear guy? Yeah. And do you, would you, do you think you would let the person respond? Yes. I'm asking you right now. How how did you become a workwear guy? I'm as, as evidenced by your, um, driveway, I'm dirty. I'm just a dirty person. My life is dirty. They're the only clothes I can work wear. And this like car hearts and stuff, you can just get this stuff always. So uh, you can would, just order it. Wouldn't like, like imagine if we all thought in, in that red and black, white and gray area, like you're a workwear guy. So you, you're smart. You don't step out of your fucking lane. No, but this guy over here, yeah, who decided to dress up for tonight because you're clearly on a first date. Yeah. This isn't your lane. Why didn't you just fucking lean into what your lane is? Yeah. And now I've shifted off of you. Right. Without offending you. Yeah. But I've sort of. But now you're offending this guy. Well, let's but you see can where fight. <laughs> let's see where it goes with him. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Maybe I'm going to offend him, but I'm also going to empower him. Right. Because I'm going to get him to leave this show yeah. deciding that he's never going to put himself in that box ah, again. Okay, okay. And so everyone's you're developing gonna, a thing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Based on intuition and 
a, a skill that no one really else has. Yeah. And the reason I have it is because I mastered it over a 20 year career, yeah. which we didn't really talk about, but I talked more shit than anyone. That yeah. was one of my tools because I was smaller and I wasn't as big as everyone. I played psychological warfare. So I want to do comedy. I, I have all of this fucking untapped material mm. in front of me that mm. I don't need to hone. Yeah. I can just blow right through it and go from the workwear guy to this guy. And maybe we'll get him out of his shell. Yeah. And in that I've gotten out of him, um, something with her mm. and you, you know, and, and mm. I can just go through a room and decimate a room mm. with laughter and fear because no also one's kind of bringing everybody together. Yes. Yeah. But what I think you should do is, is really definitely do this. Yeah. But really lean into acting. And I well, think I all actors should be writers. Yeah. Right? Every day, Sean. Yeah. See, you aren't scared. No. I, you're going to go up there and you're not going to be scared. And that Zero. Uh, zero. <laughs> yeah. Zero. A room of 200 people. Yeah. Zero fear. Fear physically fear of like not the stage fright none of that no, like fuck, in, fuck all wow nothing nothing wow. uh yeah. i'm gonna look good feel good i'm gonna be able to back up anything that i that yeah. i yeah and, but also i'm not it's it's gonna be this knack of like i want to empower him yeah. while i make fun of him that's gonna be the art like i want to celebrate the fact that you're the workwear guy yeah <laughs> <laughs> But also everyone's going to be like, you know, you laugh at them. Yeah. Like this fucking guy's the workwear so guy. So no meanness. Cause you're Canadian. A little bit, a okay. little bit. Okay. It, it'll be. A meanness that you need to make it fun and interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, if, that's if what makes small talk, small talk is there's no meanness in it. Right. True. Yeah. Well, I love this. I can't wait to see it. So your podcast is called No Gruffs Given. It's not on YouTube yet, but. But it's, yeah, we're, we're working uh, on it. all the other places, yeah, Spotify, yeah. Apple podcasts. And, um, and your book that you wrote is uh, called, um, offside or ice capades, depending on if you're in Canada or the U S and is it offside in America? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh, no, no. That's it. All right. Sean Avery. Thanks, Thank bro. you so much. And I'm going to go do your. We're going to go. I brought, I bought a gallon of degrease and we're going to get those stains. All right. All right, brother. Thank you.